Welcome back to episode 133 of Tall Boy Radio. There's no Gaz this week, if I've got my timings right. I believe he is on a flight from New York, landed in McCarran Airport, Las Vegas, as we speak. We're not jealous at all, we're not envious at all, but we are looking forward to hearing a few stories when he does come back, because no doubt there'll be a few when Gaz is involved. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our only regular host who's with us tonight first. So Andy, say hello, dude. It's been a while and tell us what it is that you're drinking. Hello. Uh, I had a holiday, but not as glamorous as what uh, Gaz has had. Uh, <laughs> but I've also changed up my beers this week. I've got a Love Lane maple syrup stout. No, Ooh. Gonna clear up. No, I don't think it's... No. No, you got to miss out on that one. It's as black as my heart. Is that all right? <laughs> nice. What percentage uh, is it? It's not a high one. Seven, oh, 7.4, so it's not, too bad. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a high one. And for, uh, for Andy, that isn't a high one. <laughs> i got Space Paranoids as well. Uh, that's another, oh, that's 3.7% that one, so. Oh, wow. I might combine the two and make 10. <laughs> yeah, good maths, good maths. <laughs> <laughs> So, like as I said, so we've got a couple of guests on tonight. I'll tell you what we're going to talk about in a minute. But I'll tell you what beer I'm, I'm drinking first before I introduce those two guys. So uh, this is from one of my holidays that I had earlier in the year that I picked up. And it's a Cotswold Lakes Cotswold Blonde. It's about 5.8%. It's not too bad, to be honest with you. It's not one of my favorite types of beers. But I've got another one to have later, which I, I had one earlier. I sent Andy a picture of it. And it is a, a mole imperial style. So it's 10% and it's flavored with chili. And it does pack one heck of a punch. I'll save that. I might not get to that later. But two people who we'll get to right now as our two guests that we have tonight. So you'll remember Dave from when he was on before a few times. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm um I've got a Titanic plum porter. And um to follow that, uh, I've got a bishop's finger to have a go at. I bet you have. Could have done with that one last week. So <laughs> have you tried the cherry porter yet? The Titanic cherry porter that yeah, one, uh, one. Because the only time I think about it is when you mention it. Um, but I I'll try. It's a good one. It's not as good as the plum porter, but actually, yeah, it's a fairly, fairly decent beer. And then finally, we actually have had Mark on before talking about a very similar subject a little bit. So Mark is he's a regular guest or has makes regular appearances on the Railway Men podcast. So do you want to say hello, Mark? Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> no alcohol for me, I'm afraid. I've um, just taken ownership of an eight-week-old puppy. Um, I can't be drinking. I need to be... Uh, I wait to be uh, cleaning him up and playing with him at two and three in the morning. Jesus, I don't envy that at all. So, yeah, so do you want to tell us a little bit about this puppy then for our listeners? What type of breed and what have you? Yeah, his name's Gizmo. I'll see if I can find him for you in a minute. Um, <laughs> he is a Jack Russell with crossed, well, his mum's crossed with a cockapoo. His dad's a pure Jack Russell. Um, I was unfortunate enough to lose uh, my last dog, Zach. Um, he's here now. Uh, about nine years ago, and he was uh, he was 16, and um, it was horrible, horrible thing to go through. And I've uh, it's taken me this long to decide whether to do it again. Yeah. Uh, just on the back of that, but uh, I decided I'm uh, I'm robbing myself of the the good years just by not want to you know to try and avoid a a sad end. So uh, I thought about it for a long time, and then a friend of mine who lives um, it's like a little farm. She's just had puppies, and she asked me to go and see him, which was a big mistake, because as soon as I clapped eyes on him, it was like, well, one of them's coming. There he is, and if we see him. There you go. Um, there you go. He's a cute little fella. But I had this, uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but people always say, let the dog choose you. So I did. I sat back, and he came and climbed on me and uh, and lay down on me, and so here he is. Nice. No, that's nice, dude. I, uh, like, so you can tell why he's called Gizmo there. He does look like the old Mogwai from the film The Grimms. Yeah. It was the brown eye, white eye. I, I picked him up, um, and I, that's what came into me first. So it stuck. But I've had all sorts of suggestions that have been better since. But uh, <laughs> he was registered as Gizmo quite quick, so it's uh, he stuck with it now. Ah, oh, cool. And does he have? A, did they have Kennel Lane then as well? Did they get Kennel Lanes as well? What was his? Did they give uh, him? I've, yeah, it's something Gizmo. I forget what it is now. I've, um, but yes, they do. Yeah. Um, when he's. They have to be registered now because he's chipped. They have a, right. a microchip and stuff. So uh, if he, God forbid, he ever goes missing, 
he's got every chance of coming back to me. Yeah, we, um, we were away at the weekend with some friends in Norfolk, and they've got um, they've got three cats who live in the middle of nowhere. They've got three cats, and they've got a stray cat that doesn't come into the house because the other cats don't like it. And they were trying to make us take it away with us, give it a good home. <laughs> Two reasons I didn't. One, I don't want a cat, and another, they called it Dave. <laughs> that's a cool name for a cat dave yeah. yeah but imagine that around our house dave stop weeing on the fence <laughs> yeah and the cat as well exactly <laughs> sometimes you know they find that that these so-called stray cats have actually got a home and food somewhere else and they just like getting fed yeah. twice and looked after twice it's always it's worse. for me <laughs> It's possible they live literally, there's things, four houses like within about a mile, so it's unlikely. It's probably, properly lost. So, we're not actually here to talk about pets, but we did want to meet Gizmo a little bit because he is a cute little fella, uh, unlike Dave the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we obviously, we're starting off now the football season. We've done a few, we've done a few episodes on football before, so. We've got a little bit of a unique experience, really, because Mark is a fan of Crew Alexandra, as we found out last time, which is in the lower league. So we can get that perspective as well, looking at the season ahead for Crew. They had an interesting season last year, interesting season coming up this year. And then, well, actually, Dave and Andy are both Man United fans, so they'll, they can bicker out as to... As to, as to their opinions about what's going to happen to them with their new manager coming forward. Myself as an Arsenal fan, Obviously, we've got a very exciting year coming up ahead of us. Some new signings brought in, and we've got a very, very good chance of winning something next year, if I do say so myself. There's no gas, so we can pan Everton as much as we like, and all he can do is listen to it when he comes back off his holidays. And he'll no doubt retort a little bit in the following episode, but I think, for the, if we're honest, he'll agree with our poor aside they actually are <laughs> <laughs> they're in the championship now could they get relegated in the end they narrowly avoided it in the last day. to be fair actually i think we talked about this actually mark didn't we the last time you were on it was quite exciting watching in everton when they were getting results against chelsea towards the end of the season and a few games like that that was probably the most interesting part of the season really because man city and liverpool was was fairly dull at the top they just kept winning and winning and winning and it was always going to be you know it was it was always going to be going the way that it went but i thought again last year the most exciting part was what was going on at the bottom end of the table you know and maybe that's something that united <laughs> can experience this year and have some bring some excitement to us all but first mark do you want to tell us a little bit then just just for ourselves as you know, obviously, the three of us all support teams that uh, have been pretty much ever well, have been ever present in the Premier League and have been in top flight football more often than they haven't, certainly with Arsenal. They're one of the, you know, the only side that's never been relegated. Do you want to tell us do you, just some experiences for yourself of football in the lower leagues and just some of your experiences following crew all these years? Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's been 35 years now. Um, and as I told you on the on the last podcast, it was um, it came about because my my mates were already going um, when I was at school, and then they kept pestering me to go along, and I, I wasn't really interested at first, um, and then I did, and uh, and got the what what I call the bug, um, but I've been brought up on lower league football, so <clears throat> I've got um, a real soft spot for. Um, the the sort of older grounds and the little grounds like um, Accrington um, and when I go to you know don't get me wrong when I've been I've been to Wembley um, I've been to the new one twice with Crew and the old one twice with Crew and uh, and they're amazing the new grounds are amazing but they're all the very much the same to me they're, they're like big concrete bowls with no character you know you've been in one and you've been in them all. Um, I'm <clears throat> I'm more of a fan of the the sort of stand on top of the pitch and all the stands are different sizes and some are wood and uh, you you know in the league that we're in now some of them are still standing there was at Rochdale on uh, on Saturday and the the stand behind the goal still terracing um, but I think that's because that's all I know or yeah. all I knew for a long time um, and I, of course like living in All Sager uh, I've seen. Uh, Luke Murphy, Lee Bell, Ryan Wintle, Sean Miller, that have all played for Crew. Like Belly's the assistant manager now. Um, 
you know, when I, I, I walk past him in Asda and stop and have a talk to him and um, and I don't think, I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing you don't get that so much at the, uh, with the with the higher higher place clubs, you know. On a Saturday, I like seeing the, the kids go and stand by the t- tunnel and um, and the players will high five them going off and stop and sign autographs and stuff. And then, you know, you see um, Sky where the kids have got at Old Trafford and uh, at Arsenal, they've got pieces of cardboard asking for shirts and stuff. And you never get that intimacy. You know, the, the top yeah. players are, are absolute superstars um, and live on a, almost a different planet. So I think that's just my experience because that's what I, I grew up on. Um, maybe if I'd been taken to Old Trafford first, then it, it would be different. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't change it now. I, I couldn't change it Um you know, it's uh, it's what I'm used to. Well, we'd be grateful for small mercies you went into Old Trafford. So, what about you two guys? <laughs> what about you two guys then, as as Man United fans? And Andy, you you're probably closer to Stockport County now. Have you ever been tempted to go and watch one of their games? Yeah, uh, I've been the, I've been the stadium twice, hmm. uh, both for uh, drink vessels. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. I should have known. <laughs> But uh, when my kids are older, I'll probably take them to Stockport. Now they're in the uh, League Two. Um, but it's, it's not a bad stadium. Yeah, it's, it's only like 10, 15 minutes away from here. So, yeah, I'll take the lad down when he's a bit older. Quite a while away, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, funnily enough, my brother, uh, he takes his lad. He's just got season tickets at Crew. He was round, uh, the, he dropped a birthday present off which we the other day. And he tried, him and his lad turn up both wearing crew shirts. You'll be you'll be pleased to. Have, uh, and I wish I could remember the name that Ben had on the back of his shirt. But it was a young Welsh lad. And uh, you'll know. Oh, him. Zach Williams. It could be. Could be. Could be, I can't remember. Yeah, he's got a young Welsh lad on the back. The back. So, so I thought fair play to him because he's got the representative of Welsh. So yourself, Dave, you, you've been to have you been to Old Trafford a few times? Have you watched the game? I've been once. I'm yeah. a proper United fan. <laughs> when he wants for a broad <laughs> sandwich. I went. I I went once. Um, and when I was probably about 14, 15, something like that. Um, but yeah, never since. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm an armchair fan, really. I've watched crew. We take the kids to watch crew two, three times a season. Um, when the kids are in primary school, we used to get free tickets from the teachers, but we also we also take them to crew. And the kids, you know, they watch crew. Albert wants me to take him to Old Trafford, but I keep taking him to crew instead. Uh, and one in our in the, the the girls team, my coach, there's one of at least one of the girls that plays in the crew development squad at the soccer centre as well in Shavington. So I've got more more ties with crew than I have with uh, Man United. Fair play, fair play. That's interesting. That, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have I been to Gresty Road. I don't think I have. I've been to watch Macclesfield Town a few times because I used to manage a store right next door to it. So I've been to watch Mac Town a few times when they were in League Two. But I, my, you know, I think Wickham, Wickham Wanderers, Wickham Wanderers is a side that I saw that play there, and I forget the others. But I, the, the, their supporters, I tell you what, I say supporters loosely because most of the time the home fans were chanting Mac. You crap. <laughs> to me, I mean, I'm not going to take anything away from them. They were. It was a very painful game to sit through. But, yeah. was, was that was that before they went bust? They went oh yeah, bust. yeah. We would. We, we, I think this was probably uh, probably the last few days of uh, Sammy McElroy when he was there. So we're talking a good long while ago. It's 2005, I think, uh, was when I left that store, and I used to watch them. You know, probably the. Uh, probably early two, very early two thousands when I you watched Macclesfield Town a few times. That's a proper old ground, Macclesfield. I like going there. Yeah, it is. It is, and I tell you what, it got a bit tasty when West Ham played there. You know, we had to we had to close up the shop because yeah, it was it was a, it got a little bit tasty. It did, it did, and that's and that's the interesting thing about English football. We had a guy on from Los Angeles called uh, Mega Man Stephen Martinez, and he was he's a big football fan, follows the Galaxy, and he, he was blown away away by some of the stuff that we were talking about. And obviously, he'd seen the football violence from the nineteen seventies and stuff like that. Found that very difficult to believe. But then again, the other stuff he found difficult to believe was the fact that we had relegation, something you don't see in American sports. I think we talked about it last time actually, more didn't we? That sort of thing. Yeah. So speaking of relegation, so cruise season last year. <laughs> yeah. How how was that for you? It's it's um comfortably the worst one I've ever seen. 
in the, in 35 years. Um, they we we got off to a horrendous start. We signed. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult to talk about now without laughing, but it wasn't funny at the time. Um, and like you two guys don't know, so it, you know it's going to sound ridiculous. But the manager signed two players that both decided to retire a week before the season started. Um, I mean, it, it's it sounds ridiculous. One decided that he was going to um, he was going to be an accountant. Um, and just completely changed careers and and did and is still an accountant as far as I know. And the other one, to be fair to the other one, he'd uh, Sean McDonald. His wife had just had a baby and he wanted to be at home a bit more, and she wanted him at home. And he um, he did carry on playing, but he went part time. Um, so that set us back straight away <clears throat> because obviously uh, all the pl- the clubs had signed the half decent players at that stage, and we were left picking up what was left and. We got off to a horrible start, and then there was contract wrangles. And to be honest, we were as good as relegated by um, by Christmas, but they didn't choose to do act on it and change the manager out until four games before the end. Um, but it, it uh, I mean, by the end, it, I was numb. You know, I was going uh, more out of habit than anything else. You know, I, I'd long stopped caring that they were losing. It was uh, it was just a matter of turning up, watching how many they lose by, and then coming back. Um, and and obviously the 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 biggest thing this season is making sure there's uh, there's no hangover from that because I think losing becomes a a, a mentality and a like a it's something that hard that becomes harder to address the longer it goes on. Um, so it, it it was good that we got off to a decent start on Saturday, but uh, yeah, it was a hard season last year. Um, I, w- I watched you know, them twice and they won both times, so I was quite happy. I'll <laughs> buy you a season ticket. <laughs> I'll pay for it. <laughs> so how are they going to do this year then? Are they, they're going to be better. Obviously, the last thing you want to see them relegate out of League Two, that would be well, that would be unthinkable. So, what, what sort of season are you forecasting for them this year? Uh, I was asked this a couple of weeks ago, and um, and the the most honest answer I could give was, for the first time in in all those years, I'm going into a season not really sure what to expect. There's a, a different manager in charge, and he signed eight new players, one from Arsenal. Funny enough, we'll talk about him in a minute, goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, but. Um, I really have no idea what to expect. Obviously, it was it was huge to get a win on Saturday because of what I've just said, the, the hangover from last year. Um, and they they did all right. First off, they they were uh, you know it was it was by far and away better than I could have ever expected. Um, but then in the second half, they were two 0 up at half time, and in the second half, it was Rochdale's first game, and they're at home, and they were always going to come out and and throw caution to the wind a bit because they've got nothing to lose by then and they did and they got one back and then the last 20 minutes was uh, I aged uh, about 10 years in the last 20 minutes but they managed to get away with a win so uh, again I, I'll know better after about 10 games I think um, but for me I think anything from halfway upwards would be a, a good season I think it's going to be more of a, a transitional season but then again if you if you listen to the manager talk and the chairman they they're hoping to be pushing to go straight back up so one of us will be right and one of us will be wrong <laughs> yeah interesting. it'll be interesting to see which and what yeah. about you what about you two guys then man united then obviously big change there at the top ten hogs come in as manager they've let's face it united one of the biggest clubs in the world one of the most financially successful clubs in the world if not the most financially successful club in the world and they, they've underperformed recently what can we expect from them this year um, we beat Chris, Liverpool four uh, 0 in the uh, preseason, so we're, it's our league. <laughs> 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 nah, top top five, I'll be happy with. Um, I, I did make a list of like, well, top seven or eight, and uh, I think United will be in there somewhere. But it can only go up from last season. It was shocking. Like yeah. we were second the year before, brought in like a few missing pieces, and all of a sudden we're, you know, getting beat by. Arsenal and all this other rubbish. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Uh, what do you think of Ronaldo, uh, Andy? Uh, when, when he when he signed, I thought he's going to be the one that all the youngsters are going to look up to and bring this like 
air of professionalism and um, train and ethos and all that sort of stuff, and everyone's just going to lift the game up. But sort of had the opposite effect. Um, if he goes, he I don't mind him going because he's like in his twilight years. He wants to break some more records and you know fair play to him. Um, but I think we've got enough youngsters now to not really. I think we'll miss some of his goals, but I think we've got other players that can make that up now. Like Sancho looks like he's got he's going to hit form this season. Um, got Fred doing some worldies from like outside the box. So yeah, as long as he don't go to the Premier League club, I, I don't mind. He can go to crew. <laughs> yes, I do know crew. I was going to ask you though, how 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 do you feel? Because it's like it, it, it's a world that I don't um, I'm not familiar with, and I don't understand. So crew's top earner, I think, is uh, is on about one thousand nine hundred pounds a week. Um, and then I read the the sort of the news this week and see that Ronaldo's been asked if he can be bought out of his final year because he doesn't want to beat United anymore. Like, how, how do you? feel about that as fans because I, I just read it and think but I, I can't comprehend it I don't understand it you know for me like the chance of playing for Man United is it, it the, the odds are so massive that um you think he I know it, it, it's his second spell and there'll be reasons for it but it's like an honor isn't it to play for United so what what what's going on as he wants to leave he wants Champions League football doesn't he he's, he's got like the most of I don't know about most appearances, but he's got like most goals and stuff. So I think he just wants to, you know, ferment that a bit while Messi's still going. He thinks he probably just wants to get a few more seasons in him. Um, but he's on like is it half a million a week. Uh, I don't know about now because of the, the pay cut of missing out on Champions League football, but that's probably like a fraction of what he earns from sponsors and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think to me, United are like, you know, like you say, one of the the highest earning teams, at least. Whether they're the biggest team anymore, I don't know. But if he wants... I, I think he's earned that sort of thing of, you know, if he goes, he goes. He, he's, he's an old player. and um, If it was like Scolzi or something like that, you know, you sort of want them to retire with the club. But Ronaldo's not had that... Um, not not loyalty, but I don't think he's got that. An English club ain't where he's going to retire. It's, it's going to be like, you know, maybe it's going to be sport in Lisbon again or... Or maybe a, a Spanish team or something like that. So I, I can't be. I'm not bothered if he goes. To be honest, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what Dave's opinion is on it as well. It's pretty similar to yours, really. I think um, you know he, he's a pretty special player when he's he's on form and and the team is set up to to work with him. And I think that was part of the problem last season was that. You know the, the the style of football that the manager wanted didn't necessarily suit his game, and that just made it difficult. And then you know, there's a, always a lot of drama. I mean, he comes off the pitch and he's not happy. Well, why would you be happy? And then everything just you know, it just you know, the media and everything else just just talks about it being trouble. And then it just starts to spiral. And the results don't go well. And everything's on Ronaldo. It's all his fault. He won't do this. He's unhappy. And you can see how it, it, it could be quite easy for a dressing room, even of you know, at Manchester United, where they um, amongst themselves they lose the confidence, they lose the cohesion and the and the team spirit, and that the games. And no matter what the manager can do, I think once that starts to happen, it becomes very very difficult to hold it together and get a series of of results. Um, and I, I I don't know what egg 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 what's his first name. Not egg, is it? I don't think he's egg now. I don't think he's egg. T- Eric Ten Hag. Eric, there we go. Egg. Egg, um, <laughs> egg for sure. Yeah, um, yes. if, if, if he's got his style of play and if he, he thinks that Ronaldo can play in that team and if Ronaldo wanted to play in that team, if those three things you know worked together, then I think he could be a massive asset for another season. But if... If either he doesn't see Ronaldo in that team as a regular or Ronaldo doesn't want to play that style of football, then he he, he will leave. But at the moment, he seems to be nobody wants him. I want, and whether that's just because of cost or he's being very choosy about where he wants to go and those clubs aren't coming in for him. Or it's all a load of nonsense and he's quite happy where he is and he wants to play for another season. Because uh, some people, you know, rightly or wrongly, Get fed up having to deny everything in the press. Mm. So say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come out and deny it. I'm not gonna give you the uh, 
the, the lines to put in your paper by coming out and denying it, why would I? And they're quite happy to let the media write all the lies and nonsense without actually, you know, joining in with their game. And he might just be doing that because he's not said he wants to leave. Well, this is the thing. Pogba got very heavily criticised, hasn't he? He's had a lot, he's another player who's had an awful lot of stick. And I said to my brother-in-law, and I'm, my brother, you know, I won't give too many stuff away about the stuff that he does say to me, obviously, because he doesn't say very much. But he was a coach at Man United up until the summer when he's moved on. He's now a coach with England. And I said to him, Matt Pogba, I tell you what, you, you know, you, it looks to me like when you're reading the papers, you need to ship him out because he seems like to be ruining the spirit in the dressing room. He says, it's absolutely untrue. This is That is literally just paper talk. Everyone at Man United absolutely loves Paul Pogba because of how hard he works in training and all the stuff that he does that you just do not see. And then the papers will just pick up on this one thing. And if he doesn't address it, then they'll stick to it and they'll keep on and on and on. And he said, none of it is true. He is a lovely lad and he's absolutely loved at that club. And I thought that's trying an interesting perspective, really. Now, I've never talk, spoke to him. Well, I've spoken to him a few things about Ronaldo because obviously I'm, fa- I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. But and and that's the interesting thing as a fan. I mean, this is, I'll take this on somewhere else actually. But when you're a fan, you have a very different opinion than when you're actually a professional at the club and doing it. So Mark said there, 1,900 quid is what the top player is on a crew. So if someone came in and said to your top player, 1,900 pound, we'll double your wages to come and play. Uh, you know, one of the other clubs, I don't know, Preston North End or somewhere like that, and, you know, that aren't a million miles away. As a fan yourself, you know, I mean, if I if I ever play for Arsenal, you know, don't get me wrong, they took Pascal Sagan, so they might take me yet. You never know. You know, I, I, you, you could pay you could pay me a pittance and I'd turn out for Arsenal and still put in the poor performances that a man of my ability would. But I wouldn't leave anywhere. I wouldn't leave to play for anywhere else for any kind of money. So do you, it's one of those things that we get frustrated that we, the players are obsessed with money and that we think that they're mercenaries. But in reality, they are professionals earning a living for their family, aren't they? And although the money at the level that, that, that we support it is, is is ridiculous. You know what I mean? When you're talking to Ronaldo, half a million pounds a week is absolutely insane. There's no way, there's no way that you could warrant that. When you actually look at all the problems in the world, in terms of homelessness and people who can't put food on a table or pay their energy bills, and yet we're giving half a million to a guy who, who sulks every time he comes off the pitch. It doesn't make any sense in reality. But, you know, these, these, guys, these guys have the opportunity to earn that money, so, so why wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? I think that's, that's the problem that football has faced. There's, t- there's two, two, three things, I guess. It's one is they're, they're just doing a job. You know, and there's a lot of footballers that see it like that as well. You know, you think of people like Paul Scholes who didn't want the limelight. All they wanted to do was do his job, play football. And there's a lot of footballers like that. And and they have an enormous amount of pressure put on them when people talk about their wages. Well, they negotiate contracts the same as any of us do when we go for a job or we negotiate a pay rise. We, you know, we balance off our enjoyment of our job and what we want to do as a career and the salary we get. And sometimes you might do a job you enjoy for less money. Other times you might do a job you don't enjoy for more money. So footballers are no different in that respect. It's just that at the higher level of the game, and, and you are talking about an absolute tiny, tiny number of working adults that are in that sphere, they get an enormous amount of stick. And then the other side, the other side of that coin is that they then get held up as role models quite often when they don't want to be. So, oh, you can't do that. You can't behave like that. You can't do this, that, the other. You're a role model. Well, no, I'm just a footballer. I didn't ask to be a role model. And then you get all the media pressure on the side of that. Now, if you're somebody that makes your living on top of football by being in the media, so your top celebrities that want the media press, want to have the hello photo shoot of their weddings, want to be sponsored by Ferrari and the expensive watches and all of that, then that's fair game. But if you just want to actually play your football and then earn a decent wage, I think a lot of them um, get a really bad rep from from the media and society in general because people in general jump onto that bandwagon, oh, ridiculous money. But, you know, who who wouldn't if you could? I think um, it, you're absolutely right, by the way. Um, if you were to describe uh, supporting a football club to anyone... Um, and broke it down into its simplest form, um, but didn't explain that it was football. They would tell you that you were talking about a cult 
Um, and that's essentially what following. It's like a cult following. I mean, on, on Saturday, for example, I, I was on um, three or four different trains and then tram and it was sweltering out and I was sweating and I had to stand up on all the trains because they were rammed and there was other football fans on there. Um, and and I said to, to one of my friends, like, there's, there's nothing else I would do this for. If I knew I'd got to go and stand on sweaty trains and, and travel up and down the country, I'd be like, no, nah, you're all right, I'll stay at home. And yet I'd do it willingly. Um, and it's because that it, it football's got that uh, that cult following that it's it's been allowed to to grow into the um, the monster, I suppose that it is, and uh, and the players are allowed to command such ridiculous fees. I don't blame them at all. Um, we've all said it. You've just said it, Adam. Like if somebody offered you uh, a, a fraction of that to do your job, you would take it. Yeah. Um, the difference, I think, is I. <laughs> Football fans have a, a real emotional attachment to a football club, um, and it can be for all sorts of reasons. You know, on, on our last podcast, you heard me talk about how crew have helped me with my mental health um, when I've struggled, and it's it's something that um, supporting crew is, is a, a big thing for me. And I know it is for thousands of football fans, if not millions across the globe, and it, it might be that your granddad re- supported them and it's a, a, a family thing. But a footballer essentially doesn't have that emotional attachment. I'm not saying all of them don't. There'll be, you know, Rooney was obviously um, very attached to Everton. And I think Ronaldo has got a, a real soft spot for certainly Sir Alex, if not United, the, the football club. So there is, there's some emotional attachment, but by and large, it's um, it's a contract negotiation and uh, and they will go and, and take as much money that they can get because it's, you know, in the grand scheme of a lifespan, it's a relatively short career. You're talking... Um, I don't know, 32, 33, and you're coming to the end of it. And I think that's no secret. Um, And players will take as much as they can possibly get while they can get it. So I'm not not saying I agree with the wages, but I'm not going to ever knock a footballer for taking them. um, You know, I don't... I think the money could be better spent elsewhere, but that's not my decision. You know, I I don't negotiate these contracts with BT Sport and Sky. Um... What I do think is that um, the the TV companies and and the the executive side sort of control a bit too much of football now than I would like um, than they used to. Um, but again, that that's that's for other people to to decide. I'm uh, I'm used to my lower league three o'clock kickoffs on a Saturday afternoon. You know, not <laughs> half past twelve on a on a Sunday. Having had to travel from I don't know London to Newcastle just to accommodate a. a a, a, a TV channel, um, but of course the TV channel will say, "Well, you're the reason that you can. We're the reason, sorry, that you can sign these players because we pay you such vast amounts of money." So there's all things to consider. It's not, not as black and white as they earn too much and they shouldn't. Um, it's no. not as simple as that. No, you, you, you're you're spot on there, and it's, that's very interesting. But it, it must there, there there is such a a gulf now between League Two. As you sort of said, with the wages that those guys are on, and just the and, and and the wages that they pay is all well and good, but the money coming in, you know, for the likes of Crew Alexandra and clubs in League Two, compared to what the Premier League club, even even if you're at the tail end of that club, you're only going to yeah the, that league. Sorry, you're only going to get a few games on Sky. You, you know, I don't think get so many games, but you know you're going to be they're, they're going to show the game when you play the Arsenal and Man United and games like that. But the the gulf between the two is is. It's, it's it's insurmountable now. That's there, and I don't think that can ever be overcome. And that's inter- one thing that I'd, I'd like to ask you guys about, just in terms of your opinion. And it wouldn't work so well in English football, but in American football, which myself and Andy and Gaz are big fans of, there's a salary cap. So each club who's playing in, in the NFL, they can only pay the same amount of wages. So you've got a set amount to pay out your wages. And if you want the big stars... And you want to pay the big money to them, well, and guess what? You've got to take those cuts elsewhere. So, you know, the like, and this is the interesting thing about Tom Brady. Everybody talks about Tom Brady as the, the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. Well, he's probably, I think he's about the 28th or 29th best paid quarterback in the league. Not just now, but just consistently. He's never taken the big money because he recognizes, well, I'm not taking the money. 
then he can have those wide receivers around him. He's got the blockers in front of him. He's got the tight ends that can do the work for him when he's a gronk, that these are the guys that then can earn the money and he can be part of the best team. And that's quite rare in American football. We've seen players like Le'Veon Bell for the Steelers who just gone out and moved because they wanted more money and got the exit out of the Steelers. And now he's nowhere. He's in no man's land because it, it worked and it worked for him in Pittsburgh. It didn't work in New York. It didn't work in Kansas. How do you think that would work? Is that something you'd like to see in the Premier League? So a wage cap so that each each club can only pay... Because you, you look at the likes of Man City at the moment and their finances that they've got, they can literally point the finger at anybody they want in the world and say, go get him. Because we can afford That's to pay what whatever they want. Financial fair play is supposed to be, isn't it? You can only spend what you earn. But mm. people like... Uh, well, City have made a mockery of that with their shirt sponsor. But... Mm. Um, Barcelona uh, over the this summer have been insane. Like you know, have made all their players take fifty percent pay cut or some degree of a pay cut. Then they're buying in all these new players, but then they're not willing to, you know, pay their players what what they've earned, sort of thing. So the the, the financial fair play is supposed to be the salary cap, but um, I don't know. I, I think there's a few bits we could take of American football, like you know, like uh, all teams have one shirt manufacturer uh stuff like that um yeah that's my two cents <laughs> well the, the problem would be is you've alluded to it there um i'm no financial expert far from it but i think on one hand you'd have the pfa um who, who are on the side of the players that would say it was some kind of uh discrimination that the players should be allowed to earn whatever they want um and that seems quite right and the clubs will also try and get round it by uh, using sponsorship deals. So it's like they'll stay, they'll sit within a, a salary cap if there was one, but then negotiate into the contract. But we'll get you a deal with Nike, um, who can sponsor your boots, and that's worth I don't know how many million to try and boost it up. So I'm not not sure it would just be as black and white as saying you can only pay this much um, towards wages. I think. Um, my granddad, bless him, he's dead and gone now, but he, he used to say that um, he'd love to see some of the top managers come and work at Crew <clears throat> and see how they managed and, uh, and and had to cope with selling some of the best players. Um, and it's an interesting thought, you know, are, are Guardiola and um, and Klopp the two best managers or have they just got the, the, the most money and most resources at the fingertips? It's an age-old argument, isn't it? I don't know. Um there is too much money at the top end, but um, how you remedy that, I don't know. Certainly, from my point of view, not enough of it filters down. I don't think it's distributed fairly, not at all. No, I, and sorry, go on, Dave. I, I think that the, the principle of a salary cap um, uh, is very good, and, and it would allow the money to ripple down. The problem and why it wouldn't work is that unless every league in the world applied it, all the best players would just wouldn't be playing in this country. Yeah. Uh, but if every league play uh, applied the same thing and it was all pegged against a, you know the US dollar or pound sterling or whatever, so the, the exchange rate, so it was all level pegging across the board, I think it'd work very well because you could still have players earning five million pounds a year, but you wouldn't have you know, six or seven or eight players in the top 25 clubs in the country earning 10, 15 million pounds a year. Mm -hmm. and one of the things we see as well, players going on loan. So, you know what I mean? So we've got the likes of Arthur Okwonko, if that's how I pronounced his name correctly. I hope no I have. idea. Sounds <laughs> right. That's it. And so he's gone alone from the mighty, mighty Arsenal down to Crew Alexander is the goalkeeper that you mentioned earlier. And that's always an interesting thing when players go on loan and end up playing elsewhere and getting some fantastic experience. And we've used it and hopefully, you know, we'll see it this year with William Saliba, who's, who's come back to the club after two years on loan, never kicked a ball for us and has looked absolutely phenomenal in, in pre-season. So hopefully, Okwanko is another one of those players who's going to go and get some experience and end up coming back to us. You know, the, the, the danger is obviously he then gets sold on after enjoying his time there. But is he, is he going to play regularly for you guys? Yeah, I think it's... Um, I mean, they, they, they'll never come out and, and publicly say this, um, but I think it's almost written into the deal that um, that he, if he's fit, he plays. Um, just to give you a, a comparison... Um, 
I can't tell you where I know this from because it, it, I, I, I don't want to, but um, it's on really good authority that he's actually earned, he earns for Arsenal 15 grand a week um, and crew are paying the whopping sum of 400 towards that. Um, so that just goes to show you that the gulf um, in, and, and he's not kicked a ball for Arsenal's first team and from what the reports were, he's nowhere near it. He's expected to play for you. Um I mean, I've only I've only seen him on Saturday. He's six foot six. He's a giant. He looks the most laid back person on the planet. Um, but you know, there's no way that we could uh, facilitate that kind of deal without a massive helping hand from uh, from Arsenal. Um, so there is there's that huge gulf. Uh, but yes, he is going to play, um, and it will do him the world of good. But for a club that um, that relies on finding young players and, and improves them and sells them, um, it's become ridiculously difficult now because the likes of Arsenal and United and, and even Stoke up the road, the really top clubs, City, Liverpool, they snaffle up all the, the best talent across the country, if not the world. And uh, cl- clubs like Crew are left with whatever's left. And, and, you know, last year, for example, there was an unnamed Premier League club that, that tried to sign one of our players, Zach Williams, before he played for Crew's first team. And he was going to be something like 14th choice left back at that football club. You know, how on earth are we supposed to compete with that? Now, luckily, he had the presence of mind and his parents did to say, no, no, I think we're we're best off staying where we are. But it shows that the the level that you're up against, um, if all the top clubs can just buy all the best talent and sign it up from, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years old, I think it's um, worse than that, isn't it, Mark? Because I think um, what's different, perhaps, when you had uh, the crew with people like Platt and all those kind of players, is that you can sign your professional contracts when you're 16, and it could be a four-year deal when you're 21 or 20. Um, if you're a quality player, you just let your contract run down, and you get snapped up with a signing-on fee. And then the club gets gets nothing or very little as compensation, despite them being with you for 10 years. They built you, or, or 15 years, they built you up, they've given you a professional contract, and then you've just gone for a signing on fee of 200 grand and five grand a week somewhere else, and, and you get nothing. It's absolutely right. And, and if they leave before 24, the club's entitled to compensation. But in, com- in comparison to what we might have made from a sale or even success if we'd gone up a league, the, the compensation is usually minimal. Um, it doesn't favour the, the club that's put all... You're quite right, that's put all the work in. Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult now to uh, to get round because the, the younger players have all got agents now. They've got agents from the age of six. Uh, and we've just seen uh, um, Harry Pickering, who went to uh, Blackburn from Crewe. Charlie Kirk went to um, Charlton. Perry NG went to Cardiff and they'd all got to release clauses in that on the day that they signed the contract, so we're left back in, in League One, um, well, he was in League Two at the time, Harry Pickham, when he signed that, £600,000 release clause on that day seemed quite good. But fast forward two years, he's playing a league higher, he's clearly one of the best uh, left backs in that league and is probably going to play in the Premier League. £600,000 is nowhere near his value. No. So we have to, we're forced then to to accept the 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 release clause that's been put in. So I know that crew at the moment are trying to formulate a a, a system whereby the, the as the value increases and the number of appearances in, increases, the release clause goes up to match that. But it's really difficult. Um, the days of uh, producing sort of Dean Ashtons and selling them for three million they're, they're long gone. Um, and it and it makes me worry about the future it, eventually i think if we're not careful we'll have a premier league and and maybe the championship and uh, and the rest of the leagues will be made up basically of loan players from all those clubs um, and that's not how it's supposed to be at, at all that's not it's not uh, that's not english football no, no, they can't. chelsea have done that on their own and they they have like is it six, 50 or 60 players on loan every year and it's just like an insane yeah. number like, that's incredible. That's an incredible statistic, that isn't it? Fifty or sixty, you know, they could fill. They could fill like several first teams just on players that they have out on loan. 
One thing I think we do need to talk about on this episode as well, because we're talking about men's football, and actually we just talked about football. You know, we've not acknowledged what we're actually talking about really is men's football. And actually something's happened really, really recently that's really put women's football on the map in England. Don't get me wrong, it's been there for a few years. It's been in the background. You know, we're talking professional, professional leagues now and professional teams. But just recently, you know, football has come home, hasn't it? What, what, what has your guys' opinions been on that? How much of it have you watched? I know, Dave, you're probably you've got a vested interest in this, given your your level of interest in you know coaching uh, with the women's game at a very very sort of young stage. But you know, what, tell tell me a bit about everybody, everybody, just your opinions on that and everything that you've seen just recently. I think it's um, I've watched quite a few of the games and, and definitely watched the final. The the quality. Of the, of the women's game over the last three or four years is just it, it, it's accelerated massively and the quality the technical quality of of the england team wouldn't put a technical side not a physical strength or speed i know we've had these conversations in another episode but the technical and tactical abilities that they're, they're not they're not a million miles off the sort of premiership championship football it's that it's that good. It's the strength and speed which would be the difference between the men's game and the women's game. But what they've done to win that is, is just amazing. And and you, you Ian Wright, who I don't know if you've heard of him, Adam. Um, I'm familiar with Ian Wright. Yes. <laughs> the thing he said on the interview uh, about hopefully now girls can play football in PE at school. And Alice, my daughter, who coaches with the girls' team with me. She's frustrated that through school, uh, after I think I think in the first year seven or year one, depending on how old you are, they could do football. But after that, the girls weren't allowed to do football. Is that right? Yeah, uh, girls have to do netball. Girls can't do basketball. There's a few things like that, but football as well. Uh, they separate them so they can't play together. My team under tens, we play in a boys. It's a mixed league, but it's 99% boys, with the exception of our team, which is all girls. And we, we, we compete down there. We had a, a competition at Macclesfield Town, actually. Um, talking to Macclesfield earlier, a few weeks ago, it was an all-girls tournament. It's the first time my team had played against girls competitively. And we got a nil-nil, a 4-0 win, a nil-nil, a nil-nil, and then lost 1-0 in the quarterfinal, which was a bit gutting, but it was pretty amazing. Uh, and, and these girls love their football. And watching the England team just inspires them no end. We, we at All Sage, at AFC All Sage, we also run a Wildcat session, um, which is just open to all girls, not necessarily sign up to a team. And we're expecting, we normally have 50 to 60 girls coming down on a Monday night. And we're expecting that number to be bigger when we start back in September than last season because of the momentum, because of what's going on with the, the England women's team. Yeah, fair play. What about yourself, Andy? Did you watch, do you watch much of the game or other games? Uh, not not this year. I, th- I probably watch women's football every every tournament they do, like the World Cups and Euros, for the last four or five years. But I've just not watched any this season or this this Euro campaign. Uh, I don't know why. I think I've just been busy. But um, you, you can see the progression every year. Like it does get bigger and bigger. And I think they're like world record uh, attendances, didn't they? This this Euros is like eighty thousand for some games and stuff. It's incredible. Isn't it? I'm not sure. So it, it, it's good. Oh, I've not watched it this year. Uh, I'm addicted to football, so I'll watch it. That's probably the reason why. <laughs> but yeah, but now it's women's football is getting there. I think uh, I don't know what the ceiling would be for it, but no, fair play. It'd be Bring interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting. What about yourself, Mark? Did you have you watched? Did you watch much of this tournament? I did, um, and my interest grew as as we got further. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's not something I've I've been interested in for, for years and years. I'm I'm not going to pretend that I have. Um, I mean, I'm 44, and, and traditionally, when I I was at high school in all stages, uh, lads played football and rugby, and the girls played hockey and netball. Um, did, there was no girls' football then, um, and I know it's it's grown in popularity. I've seen you know the the teams at uni always had. Uh, had women's teams in rugby and football, um, and we've started to feature in in uh, in the last two years 
the Crew Alex women's team on the podcast, that, like we do a match report and speak to players and the manager and stuff. Um, but I, want, I can only echo what David was saying in regards to the, the standard. Like the standard in this tournament I've just watched has, has been unbelievable. Um, the ball retention, <clears throat> um, the pace of it's improved. And one of the most notable things, I think, <clears throat> when I've watched women's football in the past, um, without being cruel, it was a bit farcical sometimes and the goalkeeping was a yeah. bit of a, a, you know, if the shot was anywhere near on target, it was usually going in and, and the games are like finishing 15, 12 and, and it didn't capture it in, in anybody's interest. And that's not being cruel, that's just being realistic. Um, but it's not like that, you know. I was, um, I, I'll tell you the truth, I leapt off the sofa in the quarterfinals and the semifinals and, and on Sunday when we scored, I was itching for him to win. Um, and I just, and I think it's brilliant that it was live on BBC, so it, it attracted a massive TV audience as well as the, I think it was 87,000 at Wembley. And I just hope now that, um, I mean, Ian Wright, bless him, was, was very quick to acknowledge that this has got to be a springboard now um, to help it grow. And I think it's also nice to, to hear the, or it was for me to hear the players on Sunday night sort of acknowledge all the, the women that have played it for the years that have preceded this, that have helped build up to this when it wasn't as popular. And they've perhaps been playing at uh, non league grounds in front of a, a one man and his dog. But all that's led up to where we are now. And I think uh, football as an industry, if you like, I don't like calling it that, but that's essentially what it is now, needs to. Um, it, it, football owes it to those, those players. To, to use this as a springboard and, um, you know, hopefully it'll grow and grow in popularity. I'd love to think of a day when um, crew aren't playing and I can rock up at Grester Road and watch our women's team play. Like, there's no reason why not. Um, I, I did watch, we took some of our meerkats, oh, sorry, the girls team called meerkats, we took them to watch uh, crew in the, I think it was, was it the County's Cup against Leighton Orient? It was towards the end of the season. It was the first time the crew ladies had played at Grester Road. That's right. Yeah, that's very true. So we, we went we went to watch that, and unfortunately they they lost um, to a goal from pretty much the halfway line that went straight over the keeper that was nowhere near it. Um, and the standard was a million miles away from what we saw with the England team, but the fact that they got to play on the first team pitch, and I think Arsenal have um, have, have guaranteed that their team will play at least six fixtures on the first team pitch. So I mean. You can't play too many games, or even on modern pitches. But there, there's a kind of um, a dilemma: Do you put the ladies' women's teams on the first team pitches and risk having six thousand people in a sixty, seventy thousand people stadium, or do you keep them in in smaller stadiums of fifteen, twenty thousand, work on filling them, and then and then go from there? And I think that's a kind of debate that's going on at the moment. But to to get to that get to that actually having that debate is is just a big step forward I, yeah, I and i mean i think um it, it it's more important than that i mean we're talking um about the absolute elite level of women's football i think what needs to happen is is essentially like for me as a kid that playing football was fun that's what you're supposed to enjoy doing it whether you're any good or not i mean i, I was never blessed with any great ability myself but like if girls want to play football at primary school, then they should be allowed, and then and high school, and it should just be encouraged and just become normal. So, it, like the next generation that are coming through, will be talking about it as if it's nothing new. It's you know, it's 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 always been around, and and they won't believe that you know, twenty thirty years ago, women's football wasn't a thing. I think that's what's got to happen now, um, and then hopefully the, the the real talent will rise to the top, and England will carry on winning tournaments. Yeah, I think one of the things we'll see off of the back of this, like Dave was saying there, you know, whether you can play in front of us in a 60,000 stadium with the, the level of fandom that they're getting, <laughs> hopefully next year you'll see a lot more people wanting to watch it because of what they've just witnessed. You know, I was in the pub actually when England won won it, and that pub erupted. Honestly, uh, you it, it could have been it could have been it could have been Arsenal winning one of their famous FA Cup games or winning the league at Old Trafford or or White Hart Lane, one of those many places that we've won the league. It could have been that because the the, the way that the people were reacting in the pub, 
probably wasn't what you'd have seen in the past. You know, you'd have had the women's game, the women's game on, sorry, in a, in a room, and, and no, there'd have been no interest. But literally everybody in the pub was glued to that telly. And hopefully that translates into interest going forward. And I actually think what these women have done for the sport in England, you, you're going to see the benefits in, in, in 10, 20 years' time. I've got my, my five-year-old daughter telling me she wants to play football because of the basis. You know, she's got no real idea of what's going on. She's, you know, I've talked to her about the Arsenal. She's not shown any interest in that, unfortunately. And neither is my little lad, although I bought him his Arsenal pyjamas and he will wear them. He just likes the fact that they're red. But... She has got an interest. She knows she's aware of what's going on that people are talking about, and she's picking up on it. And she wants to play football, just on the back of that. And that's and, and, and like 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 you say, a few years time, I think that's when you'll see the dividends of what these women have actually achieved. And you know the level of expectation when you watch the men's game and how they're going to do in these tournaments. The fact that these ladies have gone and have done that. I think is is really really exciting for the women's game, and hopefully it will bring it on in leaps and bounds just by drawing attention to it because people are talking about it now. You know, I, I, this just this morning, the 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 girl who scored the winning goal, you know, she was on Good Morning Britain and what have you. And and I hope it's not just a flash in the pan and people forget about it in two four years time. But we've got a World Cup coming up against, and obviously the Americans have got a very very good side. It'd be interesting to see how England can do against them. I mean, bear in mind I'm Welsh and you know, I'm not that vested in it, how England do, but it has been fantastic to watch. Well, I'll pick uh, I'll pick Tilly up on the 5th of September, about quarter to six, and she can come to Wildcats. That's when we start back. Listen, dude, if you can give me nine minutes break, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> She's a live wire. Well, <laughs> One so little come- frustration I've had. I don't know what you guys think, but <clears throat> you alluded to it, David, before um, around Ronaldo and Pogba and stuff. Um, I, I really don't like the British press and the British media. They, they get on my nerves. Um, they it, they seem as if uh, they want to, like, certainly with footballers, uh, uh, Gaz is the classic example. They The media build them up into these superstars with all the hype, but then the very same media want to absolutely destroy them when they get to the top and bring them down again. And I've never quite understood that. And, like, the media have been great, obviously, with with the pushing that England are going to be in the final. But then I, I've read far too many articles this week about the comparison in wages and the comparison in um, standard, you know, and, and, like, obviously you're going to get that um, England men have... have, have won anything for however long it is, 50, 60 years. So then the women have done it a lot quicker. And then it's like, yeah, but... And we're, we're, we're comparing already, whether it's wages or standards or lifestyles or support. Like, it, why? It doesn't matter. We don't do it with any other sport. We don't compare men and women's hockey to that extent or rugby or darts or anything else. So why have we got to focus? Just because we've had a bit of success, it's like, well, we need to start nitpicking now and, and, and comparing the two. We don't need to compare them at all. The two separate entities and, and let them stay in that way. It's true. The, the, the British press is incredibly, incredibly negative. I, I despise the British press. I despise the press in general, if I'm really honest. But to, certainly quite right in terms of sporting. Like we talked earlier about the likes of Pogba, and, and Ronaldo, you know, and I haven't spoken to people like, say, Neil, who was based at the club. We know the stories about Pogba were completely untrue. But they, they were there to be said and they were there to be told. And they just didn't need talent. What we should be doing is talking about what these guys are doing on the field. And actually, one of the things I wanted to talk about, because, you know, when you, you talk about people who, who I was watching, there's Northwest Tonight or Granada Reports tonight, they were talking about the trolling of of footballers and the three players that were getting the, the worst abuse in the Northwest. And Marcus Rashford. Marcus Rashford was one of those players. I love Marcus Rashford because he's somebody who uses his fame and uses his platform to do nothing but good. Yes, some of his performances have been a little bit questionable of recent. But when you look at everything that that guy does and actually uses the attention, we talked about you know people don't want the attention. This is a guy who's actually thought, actually, I don't want the attention. I don't want the spotlight on me. But if it is going to be on me, then I'm going to do something fantastic with it. And what that guy's done in terms of, like, you know, meals for kids in school, I love him. I love Marcus Rashford. I think he is. He is. He should He should be put on, you know, he should be put on a plinth in Trafalgar Square, you know, whatever you like. That's how highly I think of that guy. I think he's a fantastic, a fantastic man. And he should be an example 
to everybody else who plays the sport of just what you can do and what you can achieve when the when the world is looking at you. You know, you you should be very proud to have that guy at your club. I I, I am, and and I think what another problem with with the press and and, and fans in general is that they link poor performance with um, everything else he's doing. And he gets a lot of stick and people say, you're playing bad because of that. Yet studies studies consistently show that footballers have other interests that they can focus their attention away from football for periods of time are actually more balanced human beings and therefore play better football. And, and, but despite all of that, it's just all ignored. And, oh, you, you, you helped to write a book. Oh, you've got involved with the... the, the the um, meals for kids things and all of a sudden that's why you're suddenly off the boil no he's a professional footballer he's top quality and he's had a bit of a bad patch compared to how good he was all players that burst onto the scene and make a massive difference get found out isn't quite the right word but players adapt to then contain them more to then they have a period of where they're not as effective and they then have to work out their game a bit more to become effective again and, and people just slate him and just draw correlation or causation between one and the other it's just not true no no absolutely absolutely they're, 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 they're human beings at the end of the day and, and um the expectations that football fans have of them are just um they're insurmountable you know you, you, you they get criticized if they walk off the pitch and, and they're smiling and chatting to an opponent that they've just played against you know, if they nip out for a night out, um, they're absolutely lambasted in the press. They can't wait to get the the photographs on the front page or all over Twitter or whatever. And they're just human beings, and and football is a all right. Football is a lifestyle. It, it has to be because they're really athletes, but they're allowed to enjoy um, other aspects of the life. But you're right. The press seem to want to um, want to build them up and then destroy them, and it's. Uh, it's unfair. It's ridiculous, and um, and it, it. I mean, I don't know. It. People used to say it sells. It's old papers. I mean, I suppose these days it gets clicks and likes and um, and algorithms. It's uh, it's a strange old world. I, I I've never understood it, and I'm I'm not sure I ever will. I'm not sure I want to either. <laughs> no. So- so we're around about the hour mark now. Actually, we've not really talked about the stuff that I planned. We 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 always without actually we've done left turns without Gaz, and that's quite unusual because I always thought he was the king of the bloody left turns. He'll be very proud when he listens back to this one. We'll dedicate this one to him in many ways. So we're coming up to the hour mark. I do need to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. So all these snacks. So if you want your olives, your nuts, your pretzels, or your chocolate covered pretzels, head over to ollies olivescom Use the promo code Tallboy Radio when you're paying for your order and you'll get 20% off only if you are based in the UK and if you do don't forget to send us a tweet or something and just let us know how much you're enjoying those products so that we can send it onto Ollie's and say look guys we're doing something for you <laughs> so let's let's say our goodbyes and give our final thoughts then so who wants to say their goodbyes first Mark do you want to say goodbye first yeah, um, thank you very much again for having me on. Um, it's I've re- I've really enjoyed it. It's um, it's been good because I, we've talked about stuff I didn't ever expect to, um, and I've enjoyed it. Um, particularly the the bit about women's football. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, for asking me back. No, oh, it's been a pleasure. We'll have you back again at some point in the future. Again, like, well, that's, we, you know, I planned this episode out. I sat down on Sunday night with my pen and paper, planned out in front of me, and we not talked about any of that. As is often the way with Tall Boy Radio. Dave? Just picking on that very point, uh, Adam said, you know, jumping on the podcast, as what, what, any particular subject, you know, we're talking about the uh, football season starting. I thought, well, I don't really follow it that much. <laughs> So I've not got a lot to add. And he said, you know, the format of the podcast, you don't really need to know much. <laughs> so it's been it's been good to talk. Uh, and, you know, it has been football, um, the whole episode, but it doesn't seem like it's been about football. We've not been, uh, you know, slagging off teams and stuff. We've been talking about the background of football and lots of different aspects of it. And, and as Mark says, talking about the women's game, it's quite apt at where we are now, particularly for me, it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's been good. I enjoyed it. Cheers. Cool. Andy? 
Uh, yeah, so it's, it's been like uh, one of the old school tall boy radios where we actually have a topic and we go off off topic, <laughs> but then it's opened up more more um, episodes in the future. I think you know we we'll probably talk an hour on women's football. We could talk on different leagues. We could talk on pay, players and salaries or what they do outside of football. And I think there's there's a lot to cram into this hour. I say an hour. It's been just over an hour, but it's flown by. Like yeah, it's been good. Yeah, as you're yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, it really has flown by. It's interesting you say that. I thought that myself. I was literally looking at the clock when we we would be, and I wanted to mention the, the the women's football, and we're like forty minutes deep. I thought, wow, I was, I was planning on getting that in much much earlier out of respect to their achievements. So it just leaves it to me then to say goodbye. One thing we all universally agreed on before we started is obviously Everton definitely going to get relegated this year, be in the championship. <laughs> down the go, down the go. Yeah, and and we'll all be delighted to see it. <laughs> <laughs> on that happy note, holidays, guys. Happy holidays, guys. Enjoy Las Vegas. <laughs> Put some money on it, dude, because tell you they're going down. <laughs> so, yeah. Cheers, guys, for listening, and we'll catch you next week. Take care.